Hello YouTube, I'm Andrew Does Hair. You can find my work on Instagram at Andrew Does Hair. Several people have asked me over the years, I mean dozens and dozens of people, for camera advice for salon and barbershop use. This is a topic that I actually really enjoy talking about and, and I love getting those questions. I love sitting and researching what's out there. This is just something I kind of do for fun. This video is going to be somewhat long, somewhat technical, but by the end of it, you will have a very good grasp on what you're buying, whether one camera's worth it or the other camera's worth it. We're going to nerd out on all of this stuff. What we ultimately want to avoid as we're shopping for a camera is buying something that looks like your phone. I hear a lot of barbers and hairstylists say, well, I bought a camera, but it looks so much like my phone that it's just not worth it to bring along or it's not worth it to learn to use it any better. It is incredibly common for barbers and hairstylists to go to Best Buy or something and buy an entry-level kit camera and they don't know how to use it yet and they don't know what they bought exactly, but you know, it was five, 600 bucks, so it better be good. And they get it into the salon, they take photos with it and it looks just like their phone or even their phone looks better. This is the thing we want to avoid. That's a fail. We're gonna make sure that every dollar you spend keeps you from having a redundant camera that's gonna look just like your phone except cost more money and be an extra thing you have to bring along and learn to use. If you spend like 800 bucks on the right camera, it'll absolutely destroy a phone for haircut photos. But if you spend $5,000 on the wrong camera, it can look identical to your phone. We just need to know what we're looking at. When you, when you look at a camera online, there's a, a mile long list of specs and features. And you don't know what any of it means. I want to break it all down in this video and help you find exactly what to look for to make every dollar kind of go further. Entry level cameras are a little bit good at a little bit of everything, but as expected, they're not great at any one thing. When you start looking at mid-priced cameras, mid-range cameras, what they tend to do is get better at one thing, but not everything. It's not like a thousand dollar camera is a little bit better at a little bit of everything than a $600 camera. It's usually better at one specific thing. And that's where it gets kind of confusing and can become a money pit for a stylist or a barber who doesn't know what they're looking at. You might spend a couple hundred extra bucks to get the slightly better than entry level camera. All you bought was a camera that will shoot faster, but give you identical image quality to the entry level camera. It just gets more of the identical same entry level photo, but faster. Here's the thing, for what we're shooting, haircuts in the salon of the barbershop, it is the easiest thing in the world to shoot. We don't need a fast camera. We don't need weather sealing. We don't need 4K. We don't need like crazy high resolution because we're mostly posting on Instagram and Instagram can't even display, it's about two megapixels. So any camera you buy is going to have more resolution than what Instagram can show. We are shooting a still subject in a well-lit scene. It literally does not get easier than that. You do not need a single bell or whistle to do that. So through this video, I'm going to be kind of talking mostly about entry level to maybe mid-range gear because anything beyond that is just unnecessary for what we're doing. And I wanna to try to keep everything as cheap as possible because we are barbers and hairstylists. We are not photographers looking for the latest cutting edge technology. So anybody watching this who maybe doesn't cut hair, you might think of this video as how to get into portraits for cheap and not buy an action camera by accident. First, I'd like to speak about lenses. Lenses are easy because there's only two important features on every lens that we need to know about. One is the focal length and one is the aperture. Now this is crucial. When you go to buy a camera, you might find that you're gonna see a whole bunch of kits that come with a lens and a pouch and a tripod and all this stuff, or even just a camera and a lens, a kit. And it makes it so much easier to buy your first camera because you don't have to know about lenses and you don't have to know about anything. You go, oh, it just comes with a lens, that's easy. That lens will bottleneck the performance of any camera in ways that you cannot believe. If you take any one thing from this video, do not buy a kit buy your body and your lens separately. You see the benefit of an interchangeable lens camera, the, the way that it's gonna scream compared to a phone is that interchangeable lens. And the lens that comes in a kit is typically the worst thing you can ever buy. I mean, these things sell for nothing on eBay because as soon as you get one and you learn what a real lens is like, you go, I don't want this kit lens anymore and they go for nothing on eBay. So if you take any one thing away from this video, do not buy a kit lens. Buy your body and your lens separately. Forgive me if you can tell that I'm reading this as I go on. It's a lot of information. I don't want to get lost. But the first important feature we're going to talk about on a lens is the focal length. This is a number represented in millimeters on the lens. The lower the number, the wider the lens will see the world. The higher the number, the tighter the lens will see the world. If a lens has one focal length in the name, this is called a prime lens and it does not zoom. It only sees at that focal length. 
A zoom lens will typically have two numbers listed in the name from the widest to the tightest focal lengths that it can achieve. A kit lens commonly is 18 to 55 millimeters, but sometimes it can be a little wider and a little tighter or somewhere in that region, but 18 to 55 is kind of common. Don't think of this focal length as something that allows you to shoot something far away that you can't get close to. I know that as um, consumers and, and people who are not photographers, we tend to think of a zoom lens as a way of shooting something you can't get close to. We think of the zoom on our phone that way often. But one of the biggest aha moments that I had learning photography was learning that your, your focal length, your zoom, is not a tool to get closer when you can't get closer, unless you're shooting you know, sports or wildlife. In that case, that's what zoom is good for. But really what the focal length is going to dictate is how much background you have in your image and what your proportions are going to look like. The wider a lens is, the more background it's going to show in your photo. No matter how close or how far you shoot your haircut, if you have a wide lens, you will see your whole salon in there. You will see the whole background. Also, the closer you stand to your subject while you shoot them, the more their proportions are going to be stretched from what they look like in reality. And so if you're shooting with a wide lens, you're typically going to get in closer to fill the frame with the head. And by shooting close, you're gonna make noses bigger, you're gonna make foreheads bigger, you're gonna make your haircut proportions look off. Another thing that a tighter focal length will give you is a little bit more of a blurry background. If I have a wider lens and a tighter lens and all the settings and all the scene and everything is identical except for the focal length, the tighter lens is going to give me a blurrier background. Not that that's like of ultimate importance, but if you're trying to get something that doesn't look like your phone, that little bit of extra background blur is kind of high bonus points to, to say, hey, this doesn't look like a phone. Look how blurry the background is. Traditionally, portraiture happens at around 85 to 135 millimeters. This causes you to have to stand far enough back that you're not going to stretch out any proportions in the face or, or anything like that. And it's also going to give you a nice amount of background blur and subject isolation, meaning your haircut is sharp, everything else is blurry. And it's also going to compress the background and, and cut a whole bunch of your background out. So if you want a picture of a haircut and not a picture of a salon with a haircut in it, that tighter focal length, the 85 to 135 range is classically perfect for that. It's just where portraits traditionally have always happened. Now they can happen wider, they can happen tighter, but in those cases, you're altering proportions. And because we cut hair, our proportions are very, very important. The difference between a good haircut and a great haircut is a tiny bit of proportional difference. So shooting at 85 to 135 will give you accurate proportions. It'll make everything look just a little bit more regal, a little bit more statuesque, and, and a lot more accurate to what you saw in person. You won't have bigger noses than in reality. You won't have bigger foreheads than in reality. Like when you open up your phone and the selfie camera's on, you go, oh my God, I look like Shrek. Like you won't get that at 85 millimeters, but you might get it with a wider lens. Another thing you'll find shooting with wider lenses is that the photos will look remarkably like your phone. I will give it to phones. They do a really, really great job at what they do. But like my iPhone 13 that I'm recording on right now, I believe it shoots at the equivalent of 14, 28, and 77 millimeters. And so if I'm shooting with a $5,000 camera at 28 millimeters, it's going to look so remarkably close to my phone that I honestly don't even wanna own that expensive lens anymore because I'd rather just use my phone. And so if we're trying to avoid getting a camera that looks just like our phone, you wanna make sure you get that 85 millimeter lens because it will not look anything like your phone. Your phone can get close to it, but it's just a little step ahead of what the phone can, can still do these days. And 135 millimeters is absolutely epic for portraits, but it is a little bit harder to learn with because it is on the tight side. If, I, if somebody who was used to shooting with their phone picked up 135 millimeter lens and try to shoot a haircut it would feel like like you're looking you know through a pinhole it's it's a little bit more unwieldy to get used to but you know after you become accustomed to 85 millimeter and you go okay i want to see what's even like more hardcore get a 135 but I, I wouldn't recommend starting with a 135. now make a note about something i'm going to explain later i keep saying 85 is the key 85 is the key if you get what's called a crop sensor camera and again i'll explain it later 50 millimeters is just fine because on a crop sensor camera, 50 millimeters looks almost like 85 millimeters. Now, the second important feature of your lens is the aperture, which is sometimes written as F number or one colon number. This is essentially how wide the opening in the lens is and how much light can be transmitted through the lens. The lower that F number, 
the more light can come through the lens. The higher the F number, the less light can come through the lens. Any lens can be stopped down, which is what they say when you raise the F number from the lowest it can go, in order to reduce the amount of light coming in through it. Every lens can only go as wide and open up as much as what the F number in the name is. So if you get an F4 lens, it cannot shoot at F2.8. If you get an F2.8 lens, it cannot shoot at F1.8. If you've ever tried taking a photo with your phone in a dark scene, you'll find that it just doesn't look as good as if you're taking a photo on a bright day. This is because with any camera, the more light you have coming into the camera, the better it will perform. So getting a lens with a higher F number will actually starve the camera of light in any given scenario and cause it to not perform as well. Sure, the light might be there, but it can't get through the lens to make the image look really clean. Typically, a kit lens, a lens that will come in a camera kit, will have an F4 aperture or F5.6, and some of them even up to F7.1. That's barely any light coming in through that lens. A very expensive zoom lens will have an F number around 2.8. If you're looking at prime lenses or lenses that don't zoom, you can find an F1.8 lens for one to $500. Generally speaking, the lower the F number, the higher the price tag. And if you start looking at like F 1.2 lenses, these are like professional quality, like top grade lenses that are very, very expensive. Now, the other thing associated with the F number is a blurry background. The lower the F number is, the blurrier the background is. And again, the blurry background, it's just something that differentiates your image from a phone image. For what we're doing, f1.8 is kind of the sweet spot. We want to look at f1.8 lenses. They'll give you more background blur than your phone can do nicely, and they're not going to break the bank. If you spend one to $500 on an f1.8 lens, whether 50 or 85 millimeters, then just based on the focal length and the aperture, it can do things that your phone can't quite do as well. However, if you got a kit lens, the, both the focal length and the aperture keep it from having that grand portrait look. You can't compress the backgrounds as much. You can't blur out the backgrounds as much. This is how important it is. On the screen here is a shot at f1.8. And here is the same shot at f5.6, which is again common for a kit lens. If you get a kit lens, this f5.6 shot, that's as blurry as your camera will get. It doesn't matter if it's a $5,000 body. If you have an f5.6 lens, this is what you're getting. And then just to compare, here's the iPhone 13's portrait mode. Now, if you were to ask me, I would say that the F1.8 lens looks better than the iPhone shot, and the iPhone shot looks better than the kit lens shot, the F5.6 shot. And so this is, again, I will reiterate, do not buy a kit lens. If you're going to buy a camera, buy the body separate and the lens separate, and make sure you're getting an 85 millimeter or 50 millimeter, if you end up with a crop sensor camera, F1.8. When it comes to your camera body, do not worry about megapixels. If you bought a 10 year old entry level camera off of eBay and it's got crust on it and it's rusty, that thing still has more resolution than what you'll see on Instagram. Do not even look at the megapixel count. In fact, I would say if you're looking at two cameras and one has higher megapixels and one has lower megapixels, go with the lower one because you know, then it, higher resolution means more storage and more headaches. And for what we're doing, low resolution is actually kind of ideal. So don't worry about megapixels. Don't worry about 4K. You can't see 4K on Instagram anyways. And don't worry about frame rates because we're not shooting action. We're not shooting, you know, wildlife or sports or anything. There are only two features in the body that you actually might be interested in. So this is going to make it kind of easy. The first one, if you want to do videos kind of like this one, YouTube type videos, you'll want to get a camera that has a screen that flips out. This way I can see myself while I'm recording. If you don't care about doing this kind of video, don't worry about that. The other feature you might care about is what's called a full frame sensor. And it's kind of complicated, but I'll try to make it make sense. So the sensor is the thing inside the camera that reads the image coming off the back of the lens. Many entry level cameras, but not all of them, have what's called a crop sensor or an APS-C sensor. And then many professional cameras, but not all of them, have what's called a full frame sensor. Now a full frame sensor is 1.6 times bigger than a crop sensor. And what the bigger sensor does, if, to put it very, very simply, is it gives you more of a blurry background. This is another factor that's gonna play into this, the size of your sensor. There is a universal truth that the closer you focus to any camera, the blurrier the background will become. 
This is all lenses, all cameras, even my iPhone. I don't want to get close and have you see my pores and wrinkles, but if I walked up to this lens, the background would slightly blur out, even though I'm not using cinematic mode or portrait mode or anything. It's just, it's just how cameras work. So when you have a smaller sensor, crop sensor, APS-C sensor, what's happening is the image coming off of the back of the lens is going to miss part of the sensor. And the sensor is only going to read the middle portion of the overall image. And so it's going to effectively kind of crop in the image. It's going to give you a tighter focal length out of any given lens by exactly 1.6 times. So if you put a 50 millimeter lens on a crop sensor camera, you would take the 50 and you multiply it by 1.6 to get the effective focal length of what it would look like on that crop sensor camera. So 50 millimeters on a full frame camera looks like 50 millimeters, but 50 millimeters on a crop sensor camera looks a little bit closer to 85 millimeters. Now what this crop ends up doing by making everything tighter like that is it forces you to work further from the camera, 1.6 times further to get the same framing. And because you're now working further from the camera, you're reducing the amount of background blur. Because remember, the closer you focus to the camera, the blurrier the background becomes. And so the wider sensor itself doesn't magically somehow make the background blurrier, but what it does is it allows you with any given lens to work 1.6 times closer to the camera to allow that background blur to happen. This is a 50 millimeter f1.8 lens on a crop sensor camera. And over here is the camera's in the exact same spot, the model's in the exact same spot, but I put a 85 millimeter f1.8 lens on a full frame camera. And you can see that the framing, the focal length is very, very similar, but what's different, even though they're both at f1.8, is the full frame side is much, much smoother and blurrier in the background. If I put the 50 millimeter on the full frame, and again, I'm still not moving the camera here, it's in the same spot, you can see that it's going to gather a much wider image out of that 50 millimeter. Now, if I wanted to take the 50 millimeter on the full frame and just move it closer to the head, and again, focusing closer will blur the background more, I can do that and I will get more background blur out of the 50 millimeter. However, then I'm working close enough to the head that I'm starting to distort features a little bit. And on a side by side, it's kind of hard to see it. Um, and, and you probably won't see it right away, but in the long run, you'll start to notice these little things. You'll see that the 50 millimeter up close and the 85 millimeter far away are actually way different looking as far as the proportions go. The back of the head looks a little bit too small on the 50 millimeter. The nose is a little bigger on the 50 millimeter. And so this again is why I think 85 millimeter focal length is ideal because you can work far enough away to have nice proportions. But you add the full frame sensor, now you're gonna have more blurry background. This topic, full frame versus crop sensor, actually sparks a lot of debate. If you were to go look through YouTube for crop sensor versus full frame, you'll find as many videos for people who are pro full frame as there are people who are pro crop sensor claiming you can get the same look on a crop sensor, it's no different. And here's the thing, in many, many cases, they're absolutely right. But I'll tell you why, why full frame is right for me and why it might be right for you. As we just saw, if you put an 85 millimeter f1.8 lens on a full frame camera, I can nearly match the field of view with a 50 millimeter lens on a crop sensor, but I can't match the background blur. If I wanted to get the same background blur from the 50 millimeter on the crop sensor that I have with the 85 millimeter on the full frame, I would need a lower F number. I would actually need a 50 millimeter F1.2 lens on a crop sensor to look like an 85 millimeter F1.8 lens looks on a full frame. A 50 millimeter F1.2 lens is about $1,400. If I got a full frame Canon EOS RP for $999 and I bought a Viltrox 85 millimeter f1.8 lens, I'm looking at about $1,400. So unless the crop sensor camera was literally free, you're actually gonna get the same look for cheaper out of the full frame than you would out of the crop sensor. And this is something that kind of blew my mind when I figured it out. Think of it this way. In the long run, you might own a camera body in two or three lenses, right? If you have a full frame body, you can buy 1.8 lenses and get the same look out of those lenses that you would get with a crop sensor body and 1.2 lenses. F1.2 lenses are $1,400 and up. They, they're very, very expensive. F1.8 lenses are cheap. And so in the long run, a full frame sensor is actually a lot cheaper. It's a bigger purchase up front because the camera is going to be three or $400 more than a crop sensor. But after you start accumulating lenses, you'll really save a lot of money to achieve the same look. 
Now here's what happens really, really often. I've seen this a lot in my almost 10 years of photography now. Somebody will buy a crop sensor camera and a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens, and it's great. It's a little bit cooler than their phone, but within one to three years, they start going, I want more. And if you spent, let's say $700 on a crop sensor body and a 50 millimeter f1.8 lens, if you spent that money, the next step from there is either a 1.2 lens, which is thousands of dollars, or it's trading in your crop sensor body for a full frame body, which is starting over basically. And so if you have it in your budget to make that little extra jump and go full frame off the bat, what it'll essentially do is push back the feeling of, oh, I need to upgrade. If you start off with a full frame sensor, you can get f1.8 lenses and have more background blur than you'll ever need. And you won't even probably feel the need to go look at f1.2 lenses. But if you've got a crop sensor, those f1.2 lenses start looking really tempting. So do the math on every piece of your kit and try to think about the future. What do I want now? What might I want later? And do the math on every piece of your kit before you buy any piece of your kit because it really might be cheaper to go with a full frame, which sounds crazy because this is the first time in photography history that that is the case. Considering what we've talked about, you might go to a website and look at, say, the Canon 90D kit for $1,600 and now realize, well, it's got a crop sensor, it's got an f5.6 kit lens, it shoots 10 photos a second, and so now knowing everything we know about what we just talked about here, you can imagine that camera is not going to give you the blurry background you're looking for. You're going to spend $1,600 on a camera that's going to give you this image, but it's going to give you 10 of that photo every second. Or likewise, you might look at a Canon M6 Mark II kit and you'll find that it again has a crop sensor. It has high resolution, but we don't need that for Instagram. It comes with an f5.6 lens and for $1,100, you're essentially going to be taking 14 photos a second that look like this. Now let's say you looked at the Canon EOS RP, which is $999, and you looked at like a Viltrox 85 millimeter f1.8 lens, which is about $400. Now we're looking at $1,400, which is kind of like splitting the difference between those last two cameras I just mentioned. For $1,400, you will get this image. It'll only take that picture four times a second. It's not an action camera, but think about what you want in the salon. Do you want $1,400 for this, or do you want $1,600 for this 10 times a second? Now you can kind of look at these camera listings and go, that's an action camera, or that's a vlogging camera, or that's, that doesn't have what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an 85 millimeter F1.8, and I'm looking for a full frame sensor. And if I wanna do some YouTube stuff, I want a flippy screen. That's all you need to look for. So anything more expensive than these, if you're looking at a camera body that's more than $999, don't get it. I highly, highly, highly do not recommend a camera like that for the salon or barbershop. You will waste your money if you spend more than $1,000 on a body by any manufacturer. A body like that won't take a better haircut photo. It'll take faster photos, it'll do some crazy video stuff, but at a thousand bucks, like you've got all the convenient features, you've got a full frame sensor, what else do you need beyond that? The, the improvement even on image quality is so negligible, it takes a photography nerd looking this close to a giant monitor to say, yeah, see, I told you this one's better. You're buying neg negligible improvements that are really only going to matter for professional photographers. You're buying improvements that you literally probably will never ever see. By the time you have the eye to see it, you're gonna have another camera anyways. And think of it like this. If you were to, let's say you had the budget to buy like a Canon R6, kit with the 24 to 105 f4 lens you're going to get a, a, this this $3,500 setup with an f4 lens thinking about everything we talked about already for that same price you could get the eos rp body you could get an 85 millimeter f1.8 lens and get that blurry background that you can't get with the f4 lens you could get a set of studio strobes and you could get a macbook to edit your photos on i think if you imagine camera with an f4 lens or all this stuff for the same price which one do you think is going to get better photos don't buy a camera that's more expensive because it's more expensive you know now what features you need what features you don't need and if you do have extra money go for the f1.4 lens or if you do have extra money get a set of lights because lighting is way more important than your camera anyways or buy some online education go get a photography course i hope that this video was informative and helpful 
I hope if you're a barber or a stylist shopping for your new camera, I hope I just saved you $1,000. If you've already got a camera and you're like, oh man, I messed up, this camera's just not doing it, just start with a lens. Whatever camera body you have, just, just buy the right lens, go look for that lower F number, and you'll be surprised at what it can do. So go hawk your kit lens on eBay and, and get the 85 1.8. Anyways, thanks for watching. If this was helpful at all, please share it with another barber or hairstylist or just somebody who wants to get into portraiture and needs to buy a camera. Thanks.